Awesome. Well, it's great to be with you uh, this afternoon. Make sure I don't say that wrong. Uh, it's great to be with you this afternoon, and uh, I just uh, it's wonderful to uh, see what God is doing here at Mercy Point Church, and uh, how many of you are grateful that you are part of a church that is not just impacting Watertown, New York, but is uplifting the entire North Country region uh, of New York, and uh, amen. Uh, so excited for what God is doing uh, through your church and through your leadership team, Pastor Derek and all your leaders here at the church. Uh, so excited. Uh, and I believe this is just the beginning of what God has. There's more to come, and it's going to be exciting to see all that God does and in through the work of this church. So be a part of it, and uh, just encourage you in that way. Uh, my name again is Dan, and I serve at our network office. I, I do a lot of boring stuff that you don't want to hear about, but uh, let me share with you a little bit about my family. My wife, Hallie, and I have seven children. Uh, we just welcomed our seventh child uh, back in March. Her name is Truly Grace, and uh, that's the most recent photo I have of all of us in the same picture. Usually one of us is taking the picture, and that's usually me. Uh, but uh, we have four boys, three girls. Uh, ages 11, 10, 7, 5, 4, 2, and 6 months. And uh, so uh, just to get ahead of all the questions that I, I inevitably get after I preach and share about my family, uh, yes, they are all ours. Uh, no, there are no twins. Yes, we know how it works. <laughs> and we like it. Uh, and no, we're not going for our own television show as much as people want us to do that. Um, but uh, we're very grateful for the family God has given us, and I wish they could be with you today. Uh, they are plugged into our, our local church in Syracuse uh, and serving there as well, and uh, that's where I want them to be this morning. So um, at some point, hopefully I hope uh, you get a chance to meet them. But let's dive right into the scripture this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. Uh, how many of you have ever had to fight to be noticed in life? Anybody? You ever had a fight to be noticed in life? I, I think this is uh, part of our nature as human beings. We, we want to be valued. We want other people to see us as valuable. We want a place in life. And uh, I think it's part of who we are. I think about my children uh, when uh, uh, there, there'll be some times where I take my two-year-old daughter, Ella, and I'll say to her, uh, Ella, sweetie, let's go read a book together, and she loves to read books with me, so I take her on the couch, and I'm reading a book, and it's usually a book that is meant for two-year-olds. You have to understand this to understand why this is humorous. Uh, it's a book for two-year-olds, and so I sit in there, and I'm reading this book to her, and of course, another one of my children comes, and they uh, see that I'm giving individual attention to my daughter, and so of course, they join, they come, they sit on the other side of me, and then before long, another one of my children will come and sit on the other side of me, and then another one of them will come and weasel their way in and kind of squish themselves in between the other one so that uh, they, they've got a spot. And then another one will come and climb up on the couch and sit up on my shoulders overlooking my shoulders to read the book. This is a two-year-old book, mind you. And then finally, my four-year-old, who's usually the last one to figure out anything, I just kind of have a sense that this is going to be the way he is in life. Um, <laughs> he comes along last, and he sees that we're all hovered around reading this book, and so he comes in and, and sticks his head in this way. And uh, so then his head is covering up the entire book. And uh, I just think, to me, that illustrates that, that it's part of our nature to want to have a place in life. We're all fighting for significance, and we all want this, this place in life. Uh, if you have ever seen any reality television show, anyone, take your pick, you will see that people will do the most outlandish, the most ridiculous, the most foolish things to get five seconds of fame. Why do, why do we do that? Because I think that, that deep down inside, all of us want somebody else to look at us and say, you are valuable. You are important. You matter. You have a place. And we can laugh at the silly things that other people do to gain attention, but the truth is if we uh, were honest with ourselves, we'd realize that we've done many things in our lives to garner the intention and the favor and the value of others in order to make ourselves feel more valuable. Our perception of our value matters. How many of you know that? Our perception of our value matters, and, and it matters where we look for it. 
It matters where we find our value. Now, some people will look for value within themselves. They'll try to find it within themselves, and, and we have this search in our lives for self-esteem. Uh, I will tell you that self-esteem is not part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's actually something that our culture tries to build up within us. And self-esteem, I don't really know how this works, because it, when we self-esteem, we are, are, are by our own biased nature elevating ourselves and saying, well, I am this, and so I should be proud of it. And we often end up lying to ourselves or giving ourselves a false sense of confidence because it's all about our own skewed view of ourselves. And ultimately, we can't live with that forever because it falls short of reality. It doesn't last. We can also look for our value outside of ourselves. We can look for our value from other people. And uh, that can work, especially if we're really good at something for a certain period of time. Uh, But the truth is, there's always going to be somebody better than us. There's always going to be a moment where it doesn't matter how great you are, people are going to forget and go on to the next thing, and you're left behind. And so if we look for our value outside of ourselves, we're going to be very discouraged. We're going to be very disappointed. So what are our other options? Well, I would encourage you today that we can find our value not within ourselves, not within others, but from our Creator. If you think about uh, a work of art, anything that is created by an artist, uh, that work of art cannot ascribe its own value. It can't tell others why it's valuable. Uh, We can say that other people looking at that work of art can look at it and appreciate it and tell us why it's important or why it's significant. But then again, we compare it to other things, maybe it's not as valuable. But that work of art has more value than any of those other options when we look at it through the eyes of the one who created it. When we look at it through the eyes of the Creator. The Creator, when He looks at that work of art, He knows every piece of it. He knows every part of it. He knows why He created it that way. He knows each nuance, each uh, detail, and can show you why that is valuable. And I would propose to you today that many times in our lives, we search for value within ourselves or we search for value outside of ourselves and others when we really need to be searching for our value from our Heavenly Father, the one who created us. And I start off that today to give you some context to what we're talking about. As we look here at Genesis chapter 16, we're looking at this story of two uh, very different women from uh, very different backgrounds and places in life. And yet they're both fighting for significance, and they give us uh, uh, a good picture of this this morning. Let's read here in Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed to Sarai's proposal. This is already sounding like a daytime soap opera, isn't it? Okay. This is the Bible, folks. It says, So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had relations with Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, and this is my favorite line, This is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she is pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. And Abram replied, Look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, today it is our desire that you do in us what only you can do. And so, Lord, as we read your word today, I pray that you would open our hearts to the insecurities that we have placed in there. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how we have... uh, placed our self-worth in things that don't last and don't matter. And Father, I pray that you would help us to find it in you, and you'd help us to see our lives through your perspective. Lord, we thank you, and we praise you, and we ask that you would do this in us today. In Jesus' name. 
some context to this passage this morning. Uh, if you read earlier in the book of Genesis, we find that God has made a promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God promises to Abram, or Abraham as he is later called, that he is going to be the father of a great nation. That his descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. That, that he has this great heritage that is going to come as a result of his life. And, and he is promised that there is going to be a son that he is going to have. And uh, God doubles down on this promise. He tells it to him not just once, but twice. He says, Abraham, this is going to happen in your life. And we see here in uh, this passage in Genesis chapter 16 that it has not yet happened. So God has promised this to Abraham uh, and his wife, Sarai, who's later called Sarah. So I'll just talk, say Abraham and Sarah now so I don't get them confused. Uh, but Abraham and Sarah have been promised this great promise by God. And here we are in chapter 16. It hasn't happened yet. And Abraham is 86 years old. And Sarah, his wife, is 70 six years old. And Sarah becomes impatient. And uh, she tries to give God a different solution. Uh, it is a solution that I would suggest that not many of you wives would offer to your husbands, should you have the same problem. Uh, but it's a solution that she offered nonetheless. Uh, now, in ancient times, uh, we know that the male line was of supreme importance in that culture. And so they would do whatever it took to preserve the male line. And in fact, it was very normal, while it seems kind of strange and odd and very dysfunctional uh, as we read this today, it was very normal in that culture for if the wife of the household could not have children, that they would use a servant as a surrogate mother. Now, we have many other options today to address infertility, uh, uh, artificial insemination, and all of these other different things that can be used to address that. But they didn't have those options back at that then. And so the choice that they typically would use is a surrogate mother who was typically a slave. Now, I'm not saying that was right. I'm not going to get into all of that today. That's a whole other message. But uh, that's a side note for you to understand some of the context here. So Sarah convinces her husband to use Hagar, this slave, as a surrogate mother for her children. And Hagar becomes pregnant, and if you continue to read through the story, you find that she gives birth to a son by the name of Ishmael. And it is a number of years later that uh, Sarah also becomes pregnant, and she gives birth to the promised child, Isaac. The other thing you need to know before we get too far into our, uh, our pulling out of the text today is that this passage also has significance in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes about this specific story, and he says this story has symbolic evidence for all of us as believers. And if we read in Galatians 4, he tells us that the children of Sarah represent the children of God, and the children of Hagar represent symbolically those who are in bondage to human effort. And the Apostle Paul talks about how many times, as children of God, we act as if we are slaves to human effort when really we are children of God. And I encourage you to read that chapter of Scripture because it gives some further context into what we're talking about today, but I'll let you do that uh, on your own time uh, this week. But going back to Genesis chapter 16, we see here that this is a story of two women. Two women who are fighting for their place in the world, they're fighting for their significance, they're fighting for their value. And so, uh, as we have read this text this morning, I want to draw out a couple of things for you. Uh, I'd like us today to look at five effects of a misplaced identity. Five things that I do when I forget who I am as a child of God. Are you with me? Five things I do when I forget who I am as a child of God, and then I want to finish with one picture of God that I believe is transformative for our lives as we look at the story. So let's dive right in today. Uh, number one, a misplaced identity, or when I forget who I am as a child of God, causes me to, number one, rely on human effort. Rely on human effort. Understand this. Sarah has inherent value. 
She is the wife of a patriarch. Uh, she uh, has all of the wealth of her husband at her disposal. Uh, she has everything she could ever want or need. And she is the one who God has promised this miraculous child will come from. God made this promise to Abraham. And when God made this promise to Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation come from, uh, from your family. Abraham only had one wife. It was Sarah. So the promise related to her, it was about her. The promise was hers just as much as it was Abraham's. And yet we see here that she seeks to artificially manufacture her own value instead of resting in the value that God has already given her. So what does it mean to rely on human effort? What does it mean to rely on human effort? Well, I, I put it this way. Relying on human effort means that I find my value in what I do and not in who I am. Let me say that again. Relying on human effort means I find my value in what I do and not in who I am. It's easy for us to do. It's easy for us to do. I remember as a child, um, I, uh, I, I loved sports and I loved uh, all things athletic, but I was not very athletic. Anybody, anybody relate to that? Um, uh, I, was, I was terrible in every aspect of sports. And uh, my parents, God bless them, uh, they, they did not have the heart to tell me how awful I was. They knew it all the time, but they didn't have the heart to tell me. And uh, and uh, so I had this idea in my mind that, uh, that, I, was, that I was athletic. And uh, my parents would always talk about my cousin, Andre, who was a month younger than me. He lived in New Orleans. And Andre was a track athlete. And uh, Andre would run all of these races. He'd run these 5Ks, these 10Ks, all these different things with his school. And he'd win all these races and all these trophies and medals. And my parents would show me pictures and they would get these phone calls, you know, from my aunt and uncle telling them all the great things that Andre was doing. And they'd talk about it all the time. And so I uh, heard about all this and I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I walked up to my dad and I said, Dad, just so you know, I could beat Andre in a race. I could do it. And uh, my dad looked at my mom, and I could, I could just imagine what he's thinking in his mind. You know, it's time to tell him the truth. And uh, my dad looks, looks at me, and he says, uh, no, you couldn't beat him in a race. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, I could. And I pestered my dad day after day and month after month until finally my cousin Andre and my aunt and uncle visited from New Orleans. And my dad said, well, it's time to shut my son up. <laughs> and so he took us to a gym where they had a racetrack around the top portion of the gym, and we had a race. He lined us up. He said, on your mark, get set, go. And, and I thought, and in my mind, I'm thinking, I just got to move my legs faster than him. That's all it takes. If I try hard enough, I will be better than him. And I get around the first corner. I trip, and I fall flat on my behind. And uh, he runs around the entire track and is done before I even have a chance to get up. And I turned to my dad and I said, he, he pushed me. We got to do this again. <laughs> and I know that sounds silly, but I look back at that moment and I realize that I was trying to prove my value by what I could do and not in who I am. You see, uh, for some reason, there's something inside of us that compels us to, to see ourselves only as valuable if we have something great to offer if we have something that no one else has, or if we have something that's better than someone else has, or if we can do something that no one else can do. And when I look back at that moment in my life, I realized that my value to my father was not in how fast I was. It was not in how athletic I was. My value to my father was and always has been and is to this day because I am his son. And I could never do anything that would make me more or less valuable in his eyes. I'm his son. It's in who I am not in what I do. And we see this in Sarah. She's trying to artificially manufacture her value. She's trying to find her value in who she, what she does and not in who she is. The second thing we see in this passage is that a misplaced identity causes me to be envious of what others have. It causes me to be envious of what others have. Think about Sarah again for a moment. Sarah is the... Uh, the promised mother of this child 
that is going to be the future of their family. This great promise that God's made to her and Abraham. She is the most important woman in their household, which was a very large household. We read that their household numbered well, over three or four hundred individuals, part of their household, maybe even larger. She is the wealthiest woman in her family, and very likely, because of God's blessing on Abraham, the wealthiest woman in all of the land of Canaan. She has as much as anyone could ever have at this point in her life. And she becomes jealous and envious of a slave. Think about that for a moment. You see, the truth is, when, when I don't understand who I am in Jesus Christ, I'm going to be jealous of those with far less than what I have. We live in a culture that tells us our value is in what we have. And so when we see, when we see others with things that we don't have, we inevitably want what other people have. My children are a great example of this. Um, uh, my wife has got our basement, you know, all, all cleaned out and organized with all of the kids' toys, and she's got them all labeled in, in containers and all these different things. She's got it all sorted out, right? And my kids have, of course, their favorite toys that they go and play with all the time. And if you're a parent, you know this. There's that, that one toy that they've left on the shelf for months and months and months on end, right? And when one of my children just happens to discover this toy once again. Oh, I forgot this was here. They pull it out. It's been months since any of them has touched it. They pull it out and they open it up. And all of a sudden, everybody in the house wants to have what was in that bin. Lord of the Flies happens in my basement. Cannibalism is too light of a word for what happens as they fight over this thing that no one knew about and no one cared about until they realized that the other one had it. And isn't that how it works in our lives? Sometimes we don't care that we have something until we see that someone else has it. But you see, what happens with Sarah is a little bit more than that. It's not just that Hagar has something that Sarah doesn't have. It's that Sarah is jealous of someone who has far less than her. And this is, this is what the Apostle Paul alludes, alludes to in uh, Galatians chapter 4. He says, sons and daughters of God, heirs of the inheritance of God, should not be jealous of slaves. When you're a son and daughter of God, when you know who you are in Jesus Christ, you should never be jealous of those who are in slavery to human effort. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you've experienced a moment of jealousy or a moment of envy or a moment where you see someone else who has something that you desire and they have it because they are living outside of the bounds of God's will for their lives because they're living outside of God's plan for their life. When we experience that jealousy of what they have, we've forgotten who we are. We've become jealous of those with far less than what we have. And so, we see that Sarah tries to rely on human effort. She's envious of what others have. And third, we see that she, because of her misplaced identity, begins to diminish the value of others. When I don't understand who I am in Jesus Christ, I will diminish the value of others. You see, Sarah had no reason to diminish the value of Hagar. In fact, Hagar was where she was because it was Sarah's decision to do so. But when it came down to it, it didn't matter that Hagar was carrying Abraham's child. She was still a slave. She was still Sarah's servant. She could still tell her whatever she wanted to do. She was still way above her, and yet she feels the need to diminish her value in order to make herself be elevated. Subconsciously, of course, we do this all the time, right? Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and uh, they start telling a story and in your mind it triggers a story that you know that's actually better than their story? Have you ever done that? And so instead of listening to the story that they're telling you, oh, you just smile and nod and wait for your moment so that you can jump in and tell your story that's one step better than their story. Have you ever done that? 
We, have, we feel the need to one-up each other. Why? Because we, we want somehow to feel like we have value. And we do that by diminishing the value of others and elevating ourselves. This is what happens when we don't understand who we are as children of God. The truth is this, is that when I'm insecure in my own identity, I will diminish the value of others in order to elevate myself. And probably every single person in this room can picture right now a moment in your life where you felt put down by someone else who, because of their own insecurity, felt the need to lower your value and elevate theirs. And this, this is what a misplaced identity does to us. It causes us to forget who we are, to forget our value, and it causes us to push others down so that we can elevate ourselves and feel better about ourselves. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the truth is, is that while we're doing that, we don't even realize we're doing it. When we diminish the value of others, we don't even realize that we're doing it. That's the the danger of this level of insecurity in our lives, is that when I don't know who I am as a child of God, I will hurt others and I won't even know it. I'll hurt others and I won't even know it. And so I can never say, my insecurity only affects me. Oh, I, 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 have, I, I have trouble uh, viewing myself the way that God views me, but, but it, it, it's just my own issues and I'm going to deal with it. That's, that, that is not just your own issue. And, and, and if you deal with it privately, that's fine. But, but here's the truth. When we don't know who we are in Jesus Christ, we will hurt others and we won't even realize it. It affects everyone around us. And so Sarah is fighting for her value here. She's trying to fight for her value by uh, what she does. She's fighting for her value in what she has. And she's fighting for her value by showing what others are not. And it doesn't work. But Sarah is not the only person in this story who's struggling with her identity we see here that Hagar is as well. Hagar is struggling with her identity as well. And we see from Hagar that a misplaced identity, number four, causes us to posture. A misplaced identity causes me to posture. It causes me to pretend to be something that I am not. It causes me to pretend to be something that I am not. Remember this, Hagar is a slave. It doesn't matter that she's carrying Abraham's child. She is a slave. She is a foreign slave at that. She is a piece of property in her culture. And when she becomes pregnant with the child of Abraham, as strange and as odd and as dysfunctional as this sounds, this is the moment in her life where she has experienced more value than any other time in her life. For the first time in her life, she is someone. She is somebody. She is important. She has something of value. And for Hagar, it causes her to pretend to be something that she is not. She begins to act as if she is better than or more important than Sarah. And she begins to mistreat her. When we don't recognize our inherent value, we'll try to project an image that we think gives us greater value in the eyes of others. We pretend to be something that we're not. And we do this as a culture all the time. If you go on social media, that's all you need to do. And you will find a sea of insecurity. We are the selfie generation. We take that picture, the perfect light, perfect filter, just the right one, the hair, the, the, the wind blowing and just perfectly through our hair, post that on Instagram, hashtag blessed. <laughs> and we let everybody know how perfect our lives is and how, how much we have it all together. But the truth is, is that we are often pretending to be something that we're not. We're trying to get other people to ascribe value to our lives that they could never, ever give us the value that we need. And so we posture, 
and we pretend to be something that we are not. And that may work for a short time in your life, but it will never work in the long run. You can fool people for a moment, but you can't fool them for a lifetime. And in the end, when we try to find our value outside of ourselves and in others and somehow pretending to be something that we're not, we can deceive ourselves and we can deceive others for a moment, but we'll never deceive our own hearts. And ultimately, we cannot find our value by pretending to be something that we're not. And Hagar, we see that she is so abused and so mistreated by Sarah that eventually she runs away. And that's my final thought here on insecurity is that my misplaced identity can ultimately cause me to seek escape and cause me to run away. Hagar thought that she finally had something that was valuable. She thought she had something that no one else had. She thought, finally, I've come to the place in my life where I have something that makes me a cut above. And instead of that bringing her more popularity and more value and more love, it actually does the opposite. It brings her less. And when all of that crumbles, when all of that falls apart, what does she do? She runs. And you and I do the same thing. Because life is hard. Life is hard, isn't it? There are times in our lives where we, just, we, we want other people to see our, us as valuable. We want other people to see us as important. And we want to see our lives as having meaning and having worth. And we go into life trying to do our best to gather as much friends and love and value as we can from everything else around us. But when it comes down to it, when life punches us in the face and we realize that all of those things fall apart and all of those things are meaningless, the natural desire of our hearts in those moments is to run. And I've been there. Have you been there? We'll run, we'll run from relationships and intimacy because we don't see our value and we're afraid of being exposed as unvaluable. We'll run from challenges because we don't see ourselves as having the resources or the value to overcome them. We'll run from opportunities because we see ourselves as less than what God has made us to be. And Hagar, when she, when she runs up against this wall, when she realizes that everything that she has ever thought was going to bring her value in life actually brings her less value and all falls apart, she runs. She runs into the wilderness. She runs away, which is not a great, <laughs> not a great thing for a slave, by the way. But how many of you know you can run away from your problems, but you cannot outrun God? You with me today? I have a worship team come. Here in the wilderness, as Hagar runs away, Scripture tells us that the angel of the Lord appeared to her. Most commentators will actually say that, that when the Scripture says the angel of the Lord in this particular passage, it actually is not talking about an angel, but it's actually talking about God himself appearing to Hagar. This is a theophany. It's a, it's a, a, a divine revelation of God himself as he speaks to Hagar. And let's pick up reading here in verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. And the angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, Now you are pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. What an incredible picture. As we think about this story, and as we begin to read those lines through the eyes of Hagar, we hear what God is saying to her. He's saying, Hagar, even though you are a slave in this life, even though you are a piece of property, even though you are 
undervalued in this life, I value you. You are more to me than what you have been labeled. You are more to me than what your place is in life right now. And even though your place in life right now is as a slave, I see you as the mother of a great nation. And I'm going to do something incredible through your life. I have a great plan. I have a purpose for your life. That's what he says to Hagar. He says, even though, even though you are foreign, even though you uh, probably have never prayed a prayer in your life to me, I see what you're going through right now in your life, and I've heard your cry, and I'm answering it right now. Can you hear him saying to her and to you today, your life is more valuable than what others have said about it? Your life is more valuable than the value you've placed on it yourself. Because I have created you, I have formed you, I know you by name, and you are mine. And, and Hagar hears this from God, and she understands. She understands something that, that I, I hope you, you see and you realize this morning. She understands that her value is not from, from what she puts in herself or, or from what comes around her, but her value comes from her Creator. And we know this because she does something that no one else does in all of Scripture before her or after. She's the only one. Read the whole Bible. You'll find she's the only one that gives God a new name. Verse 13. She says, it says, Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bir Lahai Rohi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. Hagar, the Egyptian concubine surrogate mother slave, gives God a new name. El Rohi, the God who sees me. And this is significant because she doesn't say, I have seen God. Because you see, in ancient culture, it would have been uh, uh, the height of importance for you to go back into your community and say, I had a vision of God. I had this fantastic spiritual experience that none of you have ever had in your life. If you had that kind of experience in ancient times, you could walk around for the rest of your life being the one who saw God. But Hagar doesn't say, I'm the one who saw God. She says, God is the one who who saw me. God is the one who saw me. How many of you know there are so many moments in our lives where we will not see God working in our lives? We don't. There are so many moments in our lives where we do not see his hand, we do not see his face, we do not see God working in our lives. But the truth is this, whether we see him or not, he sees us. He sees us. And, and this is something that followers of Jesus Christ have to understand, that our value is not in what we do, it's not in what we have, it's not in how much better we are than somebody else, it's not in how others see me, it's not even in how I see myself, it's in who God is and what he has already done for me. And this, this is the truth of the gospel message. It's simple. It's simple. The truth of the gospel message is this, is that in all of our best efforts to obtain our value, in all of the righteous works we could have done, in all of the best human effort we could ever put forward, none of it makes us worthy of God. Scripture says that we all fall short of the glory of God. All of our human effort falls flat before Him. It does not work. But because of what Jesus Christ has done through His sacrificial work on the cross, he has made a way for you and I to come to the Father. And so, when God, when God sees us, He does not see you and me uh, for our failures. 
He does not see us for how we see ourselves. He does not see us how others see us. He does not see us in light of all the mistakes and all the ways we have fallen short. He sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of God, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, and we have the inheritance of everything that is in all of heaven at our disposal. And so, when I know who I am in Christ, I don't have to prove myself because Jesus Christ has already proven that for me. I don't have to be envious of what others have because I'm a child of God and I'm an heir to everything that God has in all of heaven. I don't have to put others down to elevate myself because God has already called me one of His own. He's already called me His child and I can't go any higher than that. I don't, I don't have to pretend to be something that I'm not because being a child of God is enough. And I don't have to run anymore. I don't have to run. Because I have the power of the living God inside of me. I want to remind you, church, today that we will never know who we are until we know whose we are. We will never know who we are until we know whose we are. Hagar was an Egyptian slave and she walked away from that well in the same place in life she had always been. A slave, a surrogate mother, a foreigner, a piece of property. But she walked back into her life different because God saw her. Would you pray with me? This afternoon, as we process the scripture this morning, we have to ask ourselves, what, what do we do now? What do we do with this information? What do we do with this truth? What do, you, what do we do with this picture of God? Well, I want to first say this. If you're here today and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you've never given your heart to Him, if you've never let Him come and be your Savior and Lord, today is your day. Today is your opportunity to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a slave to human effort anymore. You don't have to be a slave to trying to find your value in yourself or trying to find your value in other people. God is welcoming you into his family. He is waiting to adopt you as his own. And all we have to do is open our hearts to him and say, Jesus Christ, I receive you as the Savior and Lord of my life. And today, if you're here and you've never made that decision, you can do that right now in your seat, in the quietness of your heart. Or you can come up here to these altars and uh, one of the staff here would love to pray with you and share Jesus Christ with you. But I want to give you that opportunity today to take that first step in becoming a child of God. For those of you here today that are, are already followers of Jesus Christ, it is so easy for us to forget where our value really comes from. I love what my friend Dave says. He says, it's so easy for us as Christians to live for approval and not with approval. We forget that we are sons and daughters of God and we live like we are slaves to human effort and all the things that come with that. And so this morning, my hope this morning is that we come back to the simple truth of who we are in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us. And that we would allow what the gospel has done to transform our identities to do it once again. Father, today we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, I thank you that uh, even in our sin, 
even in our rebellion against you, even in all that we could ever do to disappoint and break your heart. God, you chose to love us anyway by sending your son Jesus Christ to this earth to make a way for us to you. And Father, we thank you that not only have you allowed us to come near you, not only have you allowed us into your presence, but you have adopted us as sons and daughters of God, and you've given us an inheritance that is the same as that of Jesus Christ himself. And so, Father, today we choose to be reminded of the truth of who we are in you. Father, we choose to declare over ourselves the truth that we are sons and daughters of God. We've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and that we could never have any more value than we already have than what you have already given us through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we pray today that you would transform our hearts with that truth. And God, that we would not live in insecurity, that we would not live in fear, that we would not live as slaves to human effort, that we would not live in jealousy or posturing or trying to elevate ourselves to make us feel better about ourselves. or Father, that we would not run, but we'd be able to walk into every circumstance, every moment, every challenge, every opportunity, every decision of our lives. We'd be able to walk into each one of them knowing who we are in you and that we would be transformed as we know that truth. Do that work in our hearts today as we respond to you in Jesus' name.